This episode is brought to you by the National World War II Museum here in New Orleans. During World War II, Japanese American soldiers serving under the motto, Go for Broke, courageously advanced allied efforts despite facing discrimination at home. The National World War II Museum's new special exhibit, The Go for Broke Spirit, Legacy and Portraits, explores the service and sacrifice of these Japanese American veterans through powerful portraits, personal artifacts, and firsthand accounts. Discover the legacy of patriotism and resilience embodied by these men and women. Plan your visit today at nationalworldwar2museum.org. Louisiana residents get half off of museum admission and expressions of America tickets during the month of July. See website for details. Here's what's going on with Japan Society of New Orleans. On the evening of July 24th, in partnership with Honkaku Spirits and Banana Blossom Thai Restaurant, Japan Society of New Orleans presents Spirited Away, a taste of whiskey, shochu, and more. A premium beverage tasting experience to learn about and sample Japanese spirits like whiskey, shochu, and more with the experts of Honkaku Spirits visiting from Japan. The doors at Banana Blossom Thai Restaurant in Old Gretna open at 5.30 with festivities beginning at 6. Registration is limited. Visit the Japan Society of New Orleans website, Japan Society or Crew of Japan Facebook pages, or the event registration link in the show notes for more details. Kanpai. Hello, I'm Doug, and welcome to the Crew of Japan podcast, a weekly podcast where we take you on audio journeys through Japanese culture. This time on Crew of Japan podcast. Welcome back to our podcast. For the longest time, we've been wanting to do another history episode where we take a deep look into a topic and explore. But the problem with that is it was so hard just to pick a topic out. But recently, though, I was listening to a Japan Distilled podcast episode with their host Stephen Lyman and guest host slash friend of the podcast, Matt Alt, where they were focusing on the life of a man named Jokichi Takamine. For a man so accomplished in life, I'm not going to lie, I had never heard of him. I was shocked to find out that this man was a crucial player in laying the groundwork for Japan-New Orleans relations in the late 1800s and then beyond. One could even go as far to say that Japan Society of New Orleans would not even exist today without Jokichi Takamine's encounter with New Orleans. So I reached out to Stephen Lyman of Japan Distilled Podcast and asked if he'd be interested in coming on to explore Jokichi's New Orleans impact, and he kindly accepted the invite. And the rest, as they say, is history. So today's episode, Stephen and I explored Jokichi Takamine and the impact he had on New Orleans and Japan relations, including what led to Jokichi's trip to New Orleans. It was his responsibility for indigo dye making that sent him to New Orleans for the, the World's Fair, which technically was the World Cotton Centennial. It was also known as the World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial Exposition, so really textile focused. And so with his uh, responsibility for indigo dye production in Japan, he was sent as the co-commissioner of the Japanese delegation. What ties to the city he has established? New Orleans changed Jokichi's life. He met and fell in love with a young debutante named Caroline Hitch. They apparently met at one of these balls and became quite enamored with each other. What other accomplishments Takamine had in his life? And he ended up patenting a medical adrenaline, which today we might think of as EpiPens and that sort of thing. I mean, I don't think that was an injection route at the time. Uh, but obviously, adrenaline has saved millions of lives over the last century, and it's all due to him. And so much more. And as a little lanyard, and that means a little something extra for all you non-Louisianians out there, this episode comes with a side of shochu and spirit distillation talk. But all in all, you're about to learn a lot about one of the most interesting men to come out of Japan and impact the world, including how he set the trajectory on the New Orleans and Japan relationship. Let's go. All right, welcome back to the podcast. And today we have special guest with us, Stephen Lyman, who works for Honkaku Spirits, also an author and also a podcast host. So a gentleman of many hats. So Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. Before we jump into our questions, I want to give you an opportunity just to do a short introduction to yourself. I know I, I was kind of vague when I gave your introduction, but if you want to speak to anything in a little bit more detail, the, the mic is all yours. Uh, happy to. Uh, Stephen Lyman. I'm based in Fukuoka, Japan. I often refer to it as the largest city nobody's ever heard of uh, outside of the country because I'm often met with blank stares when I'm <laughs> traveling in the States and in other countries and say that that's where I live. But it's a city of about one and a half million people. It's the fastest growing city in Japan. I believe it's currently sixth largest, a uh, big trading hub, a lot of tech, 
and banking here. A pretty vibrant place. Uh, so if you have a chance to visit, I highly recommend it. I uh, moved here about five years ago from New York City, where I had been working and living for the better part of two decades. Okay. And what brought me to Fukuoka was really an effort to try to finish up my book research. So in 2019, I published The Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks, which is a coffee table size book going through all of the various drinks traditions of Japan, from sake and shochu and awamori to their interpretations of Western drinks traditions, such as whiskey and、okay. beer and wine and、uh, cocktails. So、uh, that was my impetus for, for moving here, and I did not plan on staying, but here I am. It's,、uh, it's been a life changing experience, but I really enjoy it. I bet. And you, and you moved over there just right before the pandemic hit, too. So that was a, probably a little bit of a shock to the system after a couple of. When, what year was it that you moved there? You said 20. 2018. So I, I was here for about a year and a half of normalcy before the world went sideways. Yeah. And、uh, <laughs> I'm sure you remember that the early days of the pandemic, New York City just got ravaged. And yeah, I had some、yeah. very good friends who had very, very severe symptoms. And I, I really had almost survivor's guilt watching New York kind of burn in real、oh. time and me being in Japan where. Everybody naturally masks and social, socially distances and takes off their shoes when we go inside and you know, washes、right. their hands when they get home. And、right. <laughs> <laughs> the pandemic, especially early on, was almost non existent here in Japan. It was, it was life as usual for the most part, which was kind of wild to watch what was happening in Italy and New York and other, other parts of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they had, what was it, the ship that had come in in Yokohama, right? It was like the kind of the first big thing, but that was kind of contained to some extent. That's right. And then it was a little bit business as usual, and then it went to a little bit more lockdown mode. Correct. We never had a full lockdown.、Uh, restaurants were not allowed to serve alcohol, and they had to close by a certain time. I said not allowed, but that was actually voluntary. And, the, and it, was a, it was a carrot and stick situation because.、Mm. Businesses that were affected by the pandemic could get money from the government to stay closed. Oh,、uh, okay. Or to comply with the rules. Sure. So that was the debate. Do I take the however much money per month to stay closed or do I go ahead and operate my business as usual? And, and different businesses made different choices. Sure, sure.、Uh, but this isn't really an, an episode about the pandemic <laughs> in Japan.、So. <laughs> well, no, no, I know we kind of sidetracked there, but that, that's okay. This is very casual. And we'll come back to your Japan journey in a second. But before we get too deep into that, I did want to ask you a question we ask a lot of our other guests. Being that we are a New Orleans based podcast sponsored by Japan Society New Orleans, we ask our guests if they have a connection to New Orleans, whether it's they've been before, and if they have, what's their favorite memory? But if they haven't, you know, what is something they think of when they hear New Orleans? I've been to New Orleans many times. Yeah, it's one of my favorite、right. cities in, in the US. My earliest memory was a cross country trip with my grandparents in a Volkswagen camper van. Oh, wow. We drove from <laughs> Tampa, Florida to San Diego one summer. That's、um, a long drive. <laughs> it was. And、uh, it took us, I think, the better part of a month. And we took our time. We saw lots of sites. We'd spend a day or two here and there. And we spent, I believe, two nights in the New Orleans area. And I remember being a wide eyed 10 year old visiting Bourbon Street in the middle of the day and seeing a lot of drunk people, <laughs> which is not something I was used to from my rather sheltered childhood. Yeah. <laughs> Since then, I've been able to visit、uh, several times, twice、uh, for Tales of the Cocktail to、uh, talk about Japanese alcohol, and other times just on vacation. And it really is a city that I deeply enjoy. I think both the drinks culture, but also the, the food culture and the The really unique local culture. I mean, so much of America has homogenized in so many ways. And so to visit someplace that's still so unique、uh, is refreshing when you visit a lot of other cities that you could be in any of them.、Uh, I won't name names,、uh, but <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot, of, a lot of cookie cutter cities across the country, and New Orleans is definitely not one of them. Yeah, that, that's something that's definitely, I think, New Orleans has that. And you talk to a lot of people who travel here and visit, but not only that, like people who move here. And or come here maybe short term and end up staying long term. It's because of that, that kind of uniqueness that follows. And obviously, don't get me wrong, New Orleans has its pitfalls, like any city. But you know, if, you, if you embrace the city, the city kind of embraces you back. That, that's my impression. I have a, a good friend that, that still lives there. He went to medical school、oh, okay. in the area and never left. Married a local girl, and, and、uh, they've there you go. They become part of the community. That'll do and, it. And, <laughs> You know, whenever I visit him, I just I get the local experience, and that's, that's wonderful to, to not, not get the tourist side of the city. It's, it's just such an interesting place. It's so place different. 
it's so different if you, from like the tourist side, like doing the tourist side, because you really only see like certain small pockets of the city, but there's so much more out there that sometimes only a, a local can really show you. That's right. So back to your Japan journey. You moved to Japan in 2018 to complete the research for your book. Your podcast, it started, I want to say in 2021 or was it 2020? 2021. We, we recorded a few early episodes in 2020 and realized that we didn't have appropriate audio equipment and or any facility for editing. Sure. So we restarted our podcast, the Japan Distilled Podcast, which is all spirits made in Japan, uh, whether they be the indigenous spirits of Shochu and Awamori or uh, Western interpretations such as whiskey, gin, rum, etc. And uh, that, that did begin in 2021 with my co-host Christopher Pellegrini, who wrote the Shochu Handbook. Uh, and shochu really is the through line for my interest in Japan. Okay. I had a passing interest in Japan uh, during my childhood because of the uh, miniseries Shogun. And I had a passing interest in Japan during uh, undergrad, thanks to a, a comparative political economy course I took. Okay. Uh, which is a very geeky <laughs> reason <laughs> to be interested in Japan. And then I rediscovered my interest in Japan. It became more than a, a passing interest. It became a, a permanent part of my life. Uh, when I was living in New York and started to visit Japanese izakayas, uh, uh, the 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 uh, that dining experience where it's uh, food and drink and long lingering meals with friends is just a really really special experience. Uh, probably most akin to maybe Spanish tapas. Yeah, definitely in the West. And I, I tend to call izakaya like a Japanese gastro pub because it's always at least unless you're going to chain places, the the, the local places tend to have really high quality food great service and and nobody's rushing you to leave you you can make a 6 p.m reservation and you can leave when they close yeah uh, and nobody's gonna bat an eye because you, you're just meant to enjoy yourself and that really appealed to me uh where i was i grew up on chain restaurants where you know that waiter wanted to turn that table in 45 minutes right uh, from the time you sat down and that that frustrated me i i often wanted to enjoy my bottle of wine with my friends during a meal and have the you know the waiter come over and drop off the check when you haven't even finished whatever just <laughs> yeah. never sat well with me and and the, the, the passive really... aggressive checking in and say oh, yeah do you need anything else <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> and for me I, I really living in new york i i really got into i guess dining out right it's, a, it's an amazing food city and i got interested in wine pairings and then you know, I have started to explore all of those kinds of things around the city, French restaurants, fine dining, you know, Italian restaurants, what have you. But whenever I was drinking wine or beer, I felt kind of heavy and it wasn't didn't really sit that well with me. And sure. I always had a preference for spirits. And so I knew that things like whiskey and rum, which I was familiar with, were just too strong, too heavy, too rich, too high alcohol, really, to, to pair well with food. And of course, everyone's going to try to sell you on whiskey and chocolate tastings and things like that. Fine. Do, you, do your thing. Those spirits are just not designed for food. And I'll, I'll, that's a hill I'll die on. Sure. But shochu and awamori are. These are Japanese drinks traditions, spirits traditions that pair ex incredibly well with food. And that led me down the rabbit hole because I knew nothing about these drinks. I'd never heard of them before I had a Japanese waitress say, Welcome to Izakaya 10. It's Tuesday night, which means uh, it's $20 off a bottle of shochu. And I said, what's shochu? And she said, it's like Japanese vodka, which you should never describe it that way because uh, it actually has flavor. But um, <laughs> I just became enamored with these spirits. And there were, there, were, there were no English language resources at the time. This was back in 2007. I guess I found one website that had gone dormant that was called Shochu Circle, which was uh, hosted by a an expat who was living in Japan at the time was posting about different shochu brands he had tried. And when he moved back to the States, he stopped. And so that site had gone dark. And so I started my blog, uh, kampai.us, which was really initially was supposed to be an ode to izakaya, but really quickly turned into an ode to shochu and awamori. Huh, and okay. then through that, I ended up meeting uh, shochu makers, izakaya owners, bartenders, uh, the shochu makers in particular ended up leading to introductions to the Japanese government. And in 2015, I was named a shochu ambassador by the Japanese cabinet office. Wow. Uh, so it really went from curiosity to hobby to passion to... Uh, expert. I guess side, side gig or, yeah, I guess expert in, in a relatively short period of time. Yeah. And it really wasn't until 2012 
when I visited Japan and started to visit distilleries that it that it really grabbed me by the by the neck and, and didn't let go. Uh, and it was meeting the people who make it these uh, these craftspeople who live in the in the countryside and you know these are multi generational family distilleries and they make it the way they make it because that's how they've always made it and it's something about maintaining that tradition which has over 500 years of history in the, in in Japan that I find uh, absolutely fascinating. Well, and, and like you said, it's just so undocumented in, in English or in any language outside of Japanese, even in Japanese, like some of those distilleries, it's all very top secret, right? Oh, absolutely. And uh, many of the, the distilleries don't even have websites, let alone social media presence. So yeah. it's, uh, it's yeah, with over, I guess there are over 400 active distilleries between Okinawa and Kyushu, uh, where, I'm, where I live. Uh, Fukuoka is the largest city in Kyushu. And I don't know, maybe 20, 30 percent of them have an Instagram account. Wow. wow. <laughs> so there's a lot to explore. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's 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 quite a quite a rabbit hole. It is. You know, honestly, like we could do a whole episode on shochu and spirits in Japan. And honestly, it's not a bad idea. So <laughs> might have to tap into you a little you and Chris, maybe have you both on and yeah. we can just go down that rabbit hole together. That'd be fun. Oh, sure. Yep. He and I uh, really enjoy talking about these things. Obviously, it's uh, sometimes you just can't get us to shut up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. no. No. And, but the thing is, sometimes I just love to listen. I love to just hear about it. You know, otherwise, I'm not hearing about this stuff. So I learned a lot along the way. I mean, that's what our podcast is for. People want to learn more. And obviously, our books as well. The, his Shochu Handbook and my Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks have a really nice introduction to the, to the categories. And then the podcast actually goes deeper than the books do. Oh, okay. Yeah. Speaking of your podcast, though, that's actually how it, it kind of turned me on to the topic of today's episode. I know recently, and I say recently, a few months ago, you and a friend of our podcast, Matt Alt, had a, a couple episodes where you spoke about and took a deep dive into uh, Jokichi Takamine, who is a, a lesser known connection between Japan and New Orleans. I don't think a lot of people know about this guy, at least here. I've never heard of him until I heard about your podcast. That was the plan, just to talk about him a little bit more today and, and maybe help our listeners and, and people in New Orleans learn about this early connection, possibly one of the earliest connections to Japan that New Orleans had. Before we dive a little bit deeper, what would you say Takamine is best known for in his life? Oh, if you ask Japanese people about Jokichi Takamine, most of them will know him as the person who donated the cherry blossom trees to Washington, D.C. Okay. And the reason he was able to do that was, uh, and I think I believe many Japanese people who paid attention in school would also know that that's because he isolated adrenaline. He was the, uh, that was the first isolate of a human hormone in human history. Ever. And, uh, ever. Wow. That's right. And so he, he was also quite industrious or entrepreneurial. And he ended up patenting a medical adrenaline, which today we might think of as EpiPens and that sort of thing. I mean, I don't think that was an injection route at the time. Sure. Uh, but obviously, adrenaline has saved millions of lives over the last century. Absolutely. And it's all due to him. Uh, but having made that fortune, he he was deeply, deeply um, committed to Japanese-American relations and ended up donating the cherry blossom trees. And I believe 1910, the first, first bunch of trees had a disease and were destroyed. And then another... Uh, I believe he actually funded the second okay. importation of the trees. The first one was paid for by the government and they didn't want to pay for a second. So he did it. As I understand it, that might not be 100% accurate. Okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't even realize that the, the Washington, I, you know, I, I heard about it on your podcast, but I, you know, I, before that, I didn't realize that he was the reason. And I, cause you, I've seen them before. I've been to DC before. Um, but you also see many pictures of him, especially during cherry blossom season, just lining DC. Prior to that, I had no idea. Right. And, and most people don't. I think we just think of it as a gift from Japan. That's how it's usually described. And uh, yeah, uh, one of the, the first ladies is often credited if you read American propaganda about the cherry blossom trees. It's uh, <laughs> it was it was her doing. Uh, I'm sure she was involved. Uh, she didn't pay for them. But uh, Jokichi Takamine did. Uh, but long before that, in fact, his first experience in America was in New Orleans. That was his first time touching the U.S. Okay. So before and, we jump into his life and how he got to New Orleans... Let's put a little context on his life and his upbringing. What was the historical climate in Japan during his youth and what led him to, I guess, eventually getting interested in going abroad, not only just to the U.S., but to other countries that he traveled to? It was really due to his father. Uh, his father was a samurai physician, which was an actual job back in feudal era Japan the during the, shogun, the shogunate. 
And Jokichi was born the first son of this uh, samurai physician and a sake maker. His his mother came from a sake making family in uh, what's now Toyama Prefecture okay. on the west coast of Honshu, the main island in Japan. And Jokichi's father had studied what's known as Dutch learning in in Japanese, which is the the Dutch traders at, in Nagasaki were the only was the only point at which Westerners were touching Japan. Uh, prior right, to right. Commodore Perry sailing his black ships into Edo Bay and, and opening Japan at gunpoint with his gunboat diplomacy. And that episode actually happened coincidental to Takamine's life, but it would take several years for the feudal system or the shogunate to, to end after, mm-hmm. after he was born. And when he was young, he it was pretty clear that he was a very bright young man or, or a very bright child. So he was sent to Nagasaki to study. And that's where he learned English, which apparently he spoke English which is with a Dutch accent for his entire life. <laughs> he stayed with a Portuguese family and ended up uh, spending several years in Nagasaki to continue his his elementary or, or middle middle school education and then moving to Kyoto and then Osaka to study, first to do his military service and then uh, to go to medical school in, in uh, Kyoto. But he uh, ended up during his time in Kyoto, he lost his status as a samurai. Uh, fortunately, his father was employed as a, as a physician. The family could continue to earn, earn a living. Many samurai at this time right, uh, right. ended up you know, becoming homeless, becoming ronin, becoming criminals. And uh, that didn't happen to the Takamine family. And he was able to continue his education actually with scholarships from the domain lord and eventually from the prefecture. Uh, as this as the system transitioned and he found himself in Tokyo okay. uh, where he was part of the first graduating class from the Department of uh, Engineering uh, at what's now Tokyo University which is the top university probably in Asia but he gave up medicine and ended up studying applied chemistry and that's really where his passion ended up and like many young men from that era the safest opportunity for employment was with the new national government because that's they they needed educated young men to to become part of the bureaucracy to, to help run the country and and modernize the country and so he joined the uh, department of agriculture and ended up being tasked with modernizing japanese paper making indigo dye making and and sake production as a I think he was 27 years old, and that, that was his job. <laughs> you can imagine being given that kind of responsibility uh, right out of, of university. It's pretty incredible that a guy at his age had gotten so far. Where did this bring him next? Like, What were his next steps along his track to New Orleans, the domino effects, if we want to call it that? Sure. Actually, it was it was his responsibility for indigo dye making that, that sent him to New Orleans for the, the World's Fair which technically was the world cotton centennial so it was a it was okay. a uh, it was also known as the world's industrial and cotton centennial exposition so really uh, textile focused and so with his his uh, responsibility for indigo dye production in Japan he was uh, sent as the co-commissioner of the Japanese delegation okay and to the uh, to the world's and fair. that was 1884 that's right 1884 uh, the fair opened in December 1884 and ran through June of 1885 uh, I have not been able to find okay. when he was actually in residence, but it was approximately that six month period. Okay. So that explains the why he came to New Orleans. But, you know, that time in Louisiana, there was an, a heavy Asian presence, specifically Japanese. I mean, it's considered that he and his convoy that came over for this convention or for this fair were some of the earliest Japanese to visit this area. So, you know, how was Takamine received in the city? That, that was interesting to me when I began doing research about his life uh, for, for my book uh, and for some subsequent projects. I, I was fascinated by how he was received. Uh, he had already lost his samurai status. Uh, he had lost that uh, uh, probably a decade before, but apparently news travels slowly uh, because he was treated as, as uh, a knight, essentially. He was considered uh-huh. royalty oh, okay. by the local media. And, and he was wined and dined and invited to all of the, the debutante balls and the galas and all of the parties. And he appeared in the local newspaper on several occasions. Uh, so he had essentially full access to the best of New Orleans when he was living there, which you would oh, not... interesting. Okay. Probably wouldn't have happened 10 or 20 years later, right? But at that time, uh, he was in the right place at the right time, which seemed to be a recurring theme in his life, really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's also rumored, uh, because obviously a lot of people know of Lafcadio Hearn. He was in New Orleans as a, as a journalist for a short period of time back in the late 1800s. 
and then wrote some books on you know, voodoo, Creole recipe books, and things like that. And then eventually moved to Japan and became this massive, one of the first to introduce Japan to the Western world uh, through literature. But during Takamine's time in New Orleans, it is somewhat documented that Lafcadio Hearn and Takamine had some kind of relationship. You know, how would you best describe it from what you found in your research? It's, it's a little bit gray. There are conflicting sources, and these are all, you know, websites on the internet, so take that for what it's worth. But we do know that Takamine was the co-commissioner of the delegation from Japan. He spoke English because of his time in Nagasaki, and Lafcadio Hearn was assigned to cover the exposition, to cover the World's Fair. So there's every reason to believe that they would have interacted, that they would have met each other at one of these galas okay. or at some sort of official event and had an opportunity to talk. And it's suggested that Lafcadio Hearn later in life gave Jokichi Takamine credit for inspiring him to visit Japan. Oh, and, interesting. And may, so there might there's some indication that Takamine may have been responsible, at least indirectly, for this enormous life change that Lafcadio Hearn would undertake in, in about five years after their meeting. He ended up in Japan by 1890, at least his first visit. And, and obviously he stayed. He, he ended up uh, living the rest of his life in Japan, taking a Japanese wife, living in a Japanese home, dressing in Japanese clothes. He took Japanese citizenship. He changed his name to a Japanese name. Uh, and what makes him uh, famous in Japan today is that he wrote the first Japanese uh, folklore. The, the ghost stories of Japan were all spoken word uh, traditions, and he was the first person to write them down and publish them in a book. Uh, so uh, I guess Jokichi Takamine has, has to take at least a little credit for that as well. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> That's my guy. <laughs> That's right. And actually, this is a small point of infor information about Japan Society. Our, our book club uh, that we have for Japan Society in New Orleans is actually called Quiet on Book Club, based off of Lafcadio Hearn's uh, Quiet on Book. That's right. Yeah, probably his most famous Lafcadio Hearn is is a fascinating read, especially his travel logs in Japan. He, these are some of the first westernized to see parts of, of the country. He, he visited islands off the coast that probably no foreigner had ever been to. Wow. And now his his prose is pretty dense. Uh, so it's 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 he's a victim of his era. <laughs> he predates, predates <laughs> Hemingway, where sparse language became uh, the trend. Uh, so it's it's pretty pretty heavy reading, but uh, really really enjoyable if you're if you're curious about Japan. I, I would love to read those travel logs at some point. I think that that's always fascinating hearing those stories, especially the early days. That's right. So while Jokichi was in New Orleans, what were some of the biggest milestones, things that were life changing for him that occurred while he was here? So that's a great question, and it's, it's this wasn't planned, I don't think, but it, it follows up on how meeting Jokichi Takamine may have, might have changed Lafcadio Hearn's life and brought us some of the best early writings in English out of Japan. New Orleans changed Jokichi's life. He met and fell in love with a young debutante named Caroline Hitch. They apparently met at one of these balls and became quite enamored with each other. It was mutual. And he decided that he wanted to marry this young woman, but he didn't have the resources. But being an enterprising young man, he, he figured out a way. And he was back in New Orleans two years later in 1887 to ask for a hand in marriage. And, and they, they were married, married shortly thereafter. Okay. So after they got married, did they stay in New Orleans for a little bit? Or I, I know he eventually traveled back to Japan uh, with her. That's right. So they actually... They, they married in New Orleans, but then they, they honeymooned across the United States by train uh, and then took a, okay, took, a, right. took a steamship back to Japan uh, and settled in Tokyo. So they were only in New Orleans for a short time uh, for the wedding. And he visited the, the, the way he had made enough money to marry her is when he was in New Orleans, he had learned a lot about phosphate mining, okay. <laughs> phosphate production for fertilizer. And yep. he went back to Japan and took a leave of absence from the government and started uh, Asia's first super phosphate mine. Super phosphate. Yeah. Made his first fortune. His first customer was a Louisiana farmer oh. uh, who bought something like over 2000 tons of of his uh, fertilizer. And uh, that's how he had enough money to, to come back and marry Caroline. Oh, okay. All right. So so they, they were even, he was even pioneering some of the first import-export between Japan and, and Louisiana at that point. That's right. I mean, there, every step of his journey just makes the guy sound more and more incredible. And and New Orleans was really the, the beginning. It was really the, the, the launching pad for his 
his international success, his, really his success in the United States. Because while they would never uh, live in New Orleans again, that's, that's where he met his wife and that's where they were married. And then he ended up several other places doing amazing things. Yeah, yeah. You know, so speaking of the several other places, you know, obviously, like you said, his, his time, his stint in New Orleans was short-lived, but it is a lasting in, impact on the, the relationships because it's documented that he has, had escorted a group of Japanese businessmen to, back to New Orleans where you know some of the earliest orders of cotton were placed and then established that cotton trade between New Orleans and Japan, uh, which eventually grew even bigger and bigger. And then as a result, a little bit later in the 1920s, the consulate of Japan opened in New Orleans. It's not here anymore, but that's when it opened. And then about six years after that, a businessman named Neil Leach founded the Japan Society of New Orleans. So you could even say that Takamine's presence and his pioneering the business relationships and the connections that he developed in the early times when he came had a trickle down effect to the formation of the Japan Society of New Orleans, which I think is kind of cool. It's a little bit, you know, seven degrees of separation, but I thought it was something that was pretty interesting when I was doing a little bit of research on him. I don't think that's really too much of a stretch. He influenced so many people in so many parts of the country in so many different ways and he really had a had this knack for leaving a lasting impression on everything he touched uh, so that that makes a lot of sense to me you know obviously we mentioned earlier that i listened to your podcast and that's where i first heard about jokichi takamine i'll make sure to link those episodes in our show notes but just to put a little context on takamine's post new orleans life you said he kind of moved around to different places in your opinion what were his key milestones and interesting facts that took place after leaving the crescent city there was a few things I know for sure that happened, like you mentioned the cherry cherry blossoms, sure. sure. That also the the adrenaline, but you know maybe some other things that maybe happened in, on top of that, or even contextualize those two items themselves. Sure, he moved with Caroline back to Japan in 1887 uh, on on their honeymoon across the U.S. He studied, uh, he stopped off and visited phosphate mines or fertilizer plants. and Such a uh, romantic. And, right. <laughs> well, it gets even better. Uh, on the train, he was studying U.S. patent law. And that's another key moment in his development as an entrepreneur because he understood by the time he got back to Japan uh, exactly how to take advantage of that legal system. And they, they quickly had two children, yeah. uh, Jokichi Jr. and Ebenezer, uh, as you would uh, in that era, name a child Ebenezer. I don't, don't meet too many of them today. But, Fantastic um, name. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, smart enough to go by Evan. <laughs> he, he did not go by Evan either. But Caroline was not happy in 1880s Japan. It was uh, Tokyo would not have been hospitable to foreigners and especially not to foreign women. So she was essentially sure. homebound, uh, did not speak the language, did not have a social network. Fortunately, her, her mother-in-law sent a tel- tel- or sorry, her mother, Jokichi's mother-in-law sent a telegram encouraging them to consider relocating to Chicago. And I guess either Caroline or her mother were persuasive enough to convince Jokichi that this was a good idea. And in 1890, they moved the family to Chicago. And he very quickly quickly uh, submitted several patents to the U.S. Patent Office. The most consequential for the moment was for the use of koji to make uh, alcohol in America. So koji has been used to make sake for 1300 years in Japan, uh, but it was unheard of in the United States. And so he was able to patent the koji method for alcohol production. In fact, it was called the takamine process Ah. is what people called it in the alcohol industry. And so by the late 1890s in Peoria, Illinois, the Illinois Whiskey Trust was making a koji whiskey using the the patented takamine process. Ah, okay. For the listeners that maybe aren't familiar with sake and the sake, uh, you know, the sake production process. You know, how would you best describe what koji is? And we don't have to go down that. I know there's a whole rabbit hole we could go down there. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> I can refer you to it. Maybe the uh, cliff notes or the... Uh... <laughs> so the easiest way to describe koji is uh, koji is the national mold of Japan. National uh, mold. Japan takes, <laughs> that's right. Japan takes this mold very seriously. Um, we're all used to yeast, which is a mold, uh, making bread, making beer. Uh, and in fact, yeast is used to make virtually every kind of alcohol in the world. But koji is another mold that actually replaces malting. We use malting for beer production and and whiskey production in the West, where you're mm-hmm. actually uh, sacrificing the grains. You're breaking the starches into sugars so that the yeast can turn the sugars to alcohol. In the West, we do that with malting. In Asia, it's done with koji. That's a Japanese word for it. It's called Aspergillus orizae, is, is the classic yellow koji used for sake production. Mm-hmm. And that's what he would have been working with at the time because he, his mother was from a sake-making gotcha. family. 
And so he did experiments for several years in Illinois, trying to figure out how to how to do this with grains other than rice and ended up creating what, what was intended to become a commercial product, a whiskey that was being made in Peoria. And unfortunately, the Sherman Act was used to break up the Illinois Whiskey Trust in 1895, which put an end to the production at the distillery and the new owners of the distillery reverted to malting. So it was a failed experiment of his, and it turned out to be one of very few failed experiments of his. You can learn a lot more about that part of his life on our podcast because it was yes. it's all about the, the spirit he was producing. But he, he then, he was basically run out of town in Chicago. He sued in federal court to get his patent back and he lost. You can imagine a, a Japanese immigrant suing in federal court in Chicago in the 1890s. Yeah, probably Didn't not a high success rate right there. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but he moved his family to New York City and he established a laboratory in Harlem and in 1900. So just five years later, he ended up isolating adrenaline. And oh, okay. he had also patented several other pharmaceuticals. He goes to work quick, huh? He does. He does. Coincidental to the, to the <laughs> patenting of koji for whiskey production, he patented the use of koji as a digestive aid. So probably oh, before, right. other than adrenaline, his longest lasting medical innovation was called takadiastase which was a koji-based digestive aid. It was basically a 19th century Rolaids. Because uh, koji breaks starches into sugars, it also breaks proteins into amino acids, so it can help break down things. In fact, uh, there's a restaurant in Cleveland, Ohio, called Larder. It's a, it's a deli that uses koji to make quick charcuterie. So typically in a, an Italian charcuterie method, you make it, it takes you about six months to make like a nice dried prosciutto or sausage or something. And with Koji, you can do it in, in a matter of uh, a couple of weeks. Wow. So it's a pretty, it's a, it is a magic mold. It's a, it's, it's, there's a reason why it's the national mold of Japan. You wouldn't have soy sauce, miso, mirin. Nothing we think of as Japanese culinary tradition without Koji. So he used it for many things in his, in his uh, research. You, you need to make a t-shirt for your podcast called the, the magic mold or national mold of Japan <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, we've we've talked about uh, doing merch. I, I have a T-shirt actually that I got from a Koji fan in Germany who made a T-shirt that says "Mold is Gold." <laughs> it's just a uh, yeah. There's a the, the whole fermentation community is pretty nuts over Koji right now. Oh, I bet, I bet. <laughs> so then, yeah, I think uh, other than that, the only other I think major contribution that Takamine made during his lifetime I didn't say only he did plenty uh, is he uh, s- established the Nippon Club, which was a private gentleman's club uh, for. Japanese uh, businessman in New York City, and it still exists today. Uh, so there's still a private club because he wasn't admitted into any of the any of the clubs run by American businessmen because he was Japanese. Uh-huh. So, and by the time he passed in 1922, there was a lot of anti-Asian, anti-Japanese sentiment and and even sure. legislation. And I can't help but think that if he had lived a couple decades longer, he could have maybe even helped divert the war. Yeah, uh, but he unfortunately died uh, in his mid 60s in 1922. He lived, I, mean, I wouldn't say a short life. I mean, 60s is still pretty long, but I feel like he accomplished more in 60 years than most people do in like 80 or 90 or 100. <laughs> you know? Shoot. I mean, you could do two lifetimes and yeah. you probably Are accomplish you... more than that. <laughs> really an incredible person. I would say without question, the, the most important Japanese immigrant to ever, ever live in the United States. I don't think that that can even be debated. Um, all apologies to Ichiro Suzuki, <laughs> uh, who's a phenomenal baseball player, but um, maybe Shohei Otani is the more appropriate reference today. I-, I was about to say, I think Shohei Otani is making making people forget about Ichiro. Uh, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one more thing before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the company, Honkaku Spirits, that you work with Chris on. You started working with a distillery in Japan on the production of a Takamine whiskey, which is basically... I'm going to let you kind of describe it because I won't do it justice, but it's using the Takamine process to create it. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. This was unexpected uh, twist after my book was published and I had a profile of Takamine in the book. and I, I had obviously learned a lot about him uh, and I was having a conversation with one of the alcohol producers I know here in Fukuoka, uh, the Shinozaki distillery. And Michiaki Shinozaki, who's the son of the president at the time, he's now the, he's now the president of the company. He, um, t- taking over for his father who just retired, he and I got to talking and we were like, why don't we try to recreate what Takamine was making in Illinois in the 1890s? And they had already, they already had a barrel aging program and they had been doing some double pot distillation, uh-huh. uh, which is what would separate. So shochu uh, has to be single pot distilled, meaning only one time uh-huh. through the still. 
and and sugar in a uh, whiskey is virtually always two or three times through the pot okay. if you're using a pot still. There are only a couple of other spirits traditions in the world that do single pot distillation. And that's mm. really what separates shochu from many other traditions besides the use of koji. But basically, if you took a barley shochu or a rice shochu and you redistilled it and you put it in a barrel, by American standards, that becomes a whiskey. Because in America, a whiskey is a distilled spirit made from grains aged in oak for, gotcha. I believe, a minimum of two or maybe three years. That's it. That's it. That's Those are the only guardrails around. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of broad. <laughs> Pretty wide open playing field. Yeah. So we decided to try to create... It's, it's not what he was making. He was using very cheap uh, mash bills. He was using uh, oats and millet and, you know, the cheapest grains I could get their hands on. I think there was all like corn in the mash bill because they were trying to make a very cheap whiskey at that massive distillery in Peoria. But we decided to try to honor him and, and his experiments and, and create a whiskey. And we actually got permission from his family. There's a, a Takamine family trust in Japan even today. His U.S. family sadly had a, had a pretty dark end, but his Japan-based family started the, uh, or he started the largest, what is now one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in Japan, and his family is still majority shareholders. And so they've established a trust. Okay, I was, I was about to ask, like, how did you, I guess, how did you come up with the, or how did you, I guess, get your hands on the, the ability to recreate this That's process? That's right. So the- and, and so it was the Jap- it was the Jap- Japan side, not necessarily the U.S. side. That's right. The the, um, the patent has has long expired. Patents don't last forever. Okay. Especially when they go out of use, uh, you have to sh- you have to demonstrate use with a patent. And so sure, uh, the patent went out of use and it lapsed. So that wasn't a problem. Plus, as I said, Koji's been used to make sake in Japan for thirteen hundred years. There's nothing novel about it, right? Um, in Japan, and then it's used in shochu as well. As I said, there's over 400 distilleries here, all of them using koji. And so the Shinozaki distillery is just one of many, many, many that could have made this. But it was our collaboration that led to the Takamine whiskey. But we were sensitive to his legacy. And so we approached his family trust up in Toyama. And they gave us permission to use his name and likeness for the brand, which is the first commercial product they've ever approved for sale that they themselves didn't develop. Uh, wow. So, yeah, we feel pretty pretty special. That's great. Uh, That's awesome, man. We feel very fortunate. We have a lot of gratitude toward the family for that. I still have not met them. Unfortunately, this all happened during the pandemic, but um, I do hope to be able to get uh, up and, and meet them at some point. Yeah, you have to do like a tasting in Toyama or something. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> so is this, um, and I, I want to say, and maybe I'm misremembering, but in Japan, I know that their liquor and their alcohol laws are kind of strict. <laughs> That's being kind. Um, there's, they're very you know, cumbersome. Is this product considered a whiskey in the same sense that it is in the U.S.? Uh, it cannot legally be sold in Japan as whiskey because the, the, the standards were written by uh, Suntory and Nika, which uh, at the risk of upsetting some very large conglomerates. <laughs> um, of course. There, there is some anti-competitiveness in the way that the rules are written that the indigenous uh, sacrification tradition of koji cannot be used to make whiskey in Japan, but malting can we're still in mid 2023, so it won't be until November of this year that the hundredth anniversary of a, of the first malt whiskey being made in Japan. But the stills at the Yamazaki Distillery were fired on November 11th, 1923, at 11:11 11, 11 p.m. Oh, and wow. so we are still a few months shy of the 100th anniversary of Japanese whiskey. Jokichi Takemine was making whiskey in Illinois the year that Masatake Taketsuru was born. The guy who built the Yamazaki distillery wasn't even alive when Takamine so patented. He was ahead of the game already. He used Koji to make whiskey. <laughs> yeah, a generation ahead. Uh, but he never went back to Japan. Uh, I can imagine if Takamine had taken his his knowledge from uh, his experience in Peoria and, and given up on the U.S. and moved back to Japan, he might have started the first whiskey distillery. And Koji whiskey might now be the established Japanese style of whiskey. So it's it's kind of wild to think of these alternate universes. Um, but to me, it's silly that koji cannot be used to make whiskey in Japan. Technically, it can, but you have to have at least 10% of the of the mash bill has to be malt, malted grains. And there's no reason to use malt and koji in the same fermentation. It just doesn't make sense. So uh, koji whiskey does not exist in Japan. Fortunately, it exists in the U.S. and other parts of the world. Uh, because uh, to me, it's actually it makes a very, very interesting drink. I mentioned that koji creates protease, which breaks proteins into amino acids. 
for your fans of Japanese food, amino acid is what gives you the sense of umami. So, shochu, awamori, and koji whiskey are all umami laden spirits. There's a depth of flavor underneath the drink that you don't get in a lot of Western traditions. So,、uh, for me, I think Japan's being quite short sighted and not allowing、uh, the takamine process to live as a Japanese style of whiskey.、Uh, but, you know, I don't write the rules, I just complain about them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's Japanese law and, and whiskey and all that fun stuff with the, you know, how, how they regulate that industry. So, like you said, what can you do? All we can do is complain about it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, this has been a lot of fun. I, I've learned a lot from, from this episode. There w a s things in here that weren't in, and you know, little tidbits here and there that we kind of touched on that maybe were outside of the scope of your other episode. In terms of koji and chochu and, and things like that, on top of takimine. So, I think it was great to hear all this because some of it was new to me. I am going through your back catalog and learning more about your, your, you guys and what, they, what you know about shochu and Japanese spirits. So, I'm looking forward to listening to some more episodes of your podcast. I appreciate that. I was hoping to get out of this that the episodes would complement each other rather than if you've listened to those, you don't need、yeah. to listen to this. Actually, you need to listen to this, I think, because there's a lot more、uh, color and context here. Uh, than, than in, in those episodes. Those episodes are much more focused on, of course, his life, but also the, the historical context around in which he was living and then the, how it all led to the whiskey and then the, him getting run out of Chicago. No, and, and the before and after and everything, like the detail you and Matt went into in that, those episodes was fantastic. I, I was enthralled from start to finish of both. So. <laughs> Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, it's always nice to hear people enjoy the podcast. Before we wrap up, I wanted to give you an opportunity just to mention anything else you got going on, you know, where people can find you online, social media, but also other projects you have going on. I know you will be in New Orleans、uh, in a few weeks. That's right. For Tales for the Cocktails and also an event that we're putting on together at a local Thai restaurant. So we can talk about that too. But go ahead and, and kind of share where, what you got going on and where people can find you first. So, social media wise, you can find me at Japan Distilled on、uh, Twitter and Instagram. Those are the places I'm probably most active. Christopher and I actually will be involved in a Koji Spirits panel discussion at Tales of the Cocktail. I think that's for registrants of the conference. I don't think that、uh, it's open to the public unless you buy the day ticket for that day. That's on the Thursday, July 27th, I want to say. Yep,、okay. July 27th in the afternoon at the Ritz Carlton in New Orleans. We'll be giving that.、Uh, I'm the moderator for the panel. Christopher is one of the panelists, along with、uh, Jesse Fallow. It's a Mizu Shochu, Toshio Ueno from Mutual Trading Company, and Chris Uday, who's the Vice President of Spirits for Impex Beverages. He was actually the first importer of Koji whiskey to America.、Uh, oh, so、okay. it should be a great discussion, a really, really deep dive on Koji spirits and what makes them special.、Uh, we are also, as you mentioned, doing a public event,、uh, a little happy hour with Japan Society of New Orleans at、uh, Banana Blossom Thai Restaurant. Yes,、uh, very much looking forward to that. As I mentioned earlier, Koji spirits have umami, and it goes amazing with like big, bold flavors like Thai food, Chinese food,、uh, obviously Japanese food, but it should be a lot of fun to do a little bit of、uh, side, you know,、uh, several of Honkaku spirits products will be available to try, and there will be some small bites so you can play around with food pairings, which is what drew me into this entire world to begin with. Right. So that, that should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. And. Yeah, if you're interested in the Honkaku Spirits products, you can go to the website honkakuspirits.com. Lots of information on there, as well as、uh, profiles of all of our brands. They are available in Louisiana, and、uh, hopefully, people can find them and enjoy them.、They're, we we really, as we built the portfolio, we were trying to find the best spirits in Japan that we could get access to and import them to the US. We really wanted to put together a really special. Group of products. All of our suppliers are, are、uh, multi generational family run distilleries. We don't work with the big conglomerates because、uh, A, they annoy us, and B, they won't talk to us. So <laughs> I think we're、uh, committed to helping these small family distilleries、uh, maintain their traditions. And, and、uh, if you'd like to come out, if you're in the New Orleans area, I'd like to come out and learn more. That'll be on、uh, Monday, July 24th at Banana Blossom.、Yeah. So that should be a lot of fun. Do you know the hours for that? Doors and pours start at 5 30. Okay. Yeah. Proper, proper happy hour. I think around 6 is technically our festivities begin. And there's no, I mean, we say 7 30 on the event, but when speaking with the owners over at Banana Blossom, they weren't going to kick us out right at 7 30. So it's kind of come out and hang out, taste、yeah. some food, taste some shochu and some whiskey,、uh, yeah, some please, aomori. Please come, 
come say hello. Uh, yeah. If you are involved in Tales at all, uh, we or you're vi- planning on visiting Tales, Christopher and I are both doing book signings uh, two or three different times during the during Tales. I don't have the calendar in front of me, unfortunately, but uh, it should be uh, on their website, uh, talesofthecocktail.com. Awesome. And I just wanted to let you know, I haven't told you this yet, but um, I got my bottle of Takamine whiskey in the mail last week, or this oh, past very week. very nice. And it was absolutely delicious. So smooth to drink. My uh, my neighbor came over and we had a small sampling of it, and he went back for thirds. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, he that's was like, "This is some of the best whiskey I've ever had." So, uh, yeah. and he's had a lot. <laughs> very, very nice to hear. Yeah, we're we're very proud of it. The Shinazaki uh, family does an amazing job with the Takamine whiskey, and we're really uh, grateful to have them as as partners in that brand. And hopefully. Uh, others of your listeners have a chance to try it as well and enjoy it. We, we really, like I said, try to try to bring the best of Japan to the U.S. So, well, from my experience with your product so far, and it, we'll find out more on July 24th. But uh, so far, I mean, I, I'm I'm in. <laughs> Great, <laughs> glad to hear it. We need, we need about about 10,000 more people like you to. Uh... <laughs> well, hopefully, this will get a few. You know, at least send a few more your way. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No. Uh, thank you very much. I really uh, always love to talk about Jokichi Takamine. I guess uh, maybe a little personal news. I actually um, have been in communication with uh, some surviving members of his family, as well as Daiichi Sankyo, the, the pharmaceutical company, okay. about gaining access to the archives. And I'm planning on learning as much as I can about him. And potentially, uh, he may become the topic of my next book, if not oh, wow. directly a biography about him, but putting him into the context or his life awesome. in the context of what Japan was like in that era. So that's exciting. Yeah, not what I expected to be writing next, but it's it's a, a pleasure to be able to tell this man's story because he really is a, a, a unique part of American Japanese relations. Very much so. Very much so. Well, if our listeners want to find out more, again, like I said, I'll have your two part episode series linked down in the show notes so that way they can go to it and find out more there. And then hopefully with your next book, we'll find out a lot more. <laughs> Let's see. From, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stephen. Well, thank you again so much for coming on. I had, it was a blast talking with you and I look forward to seeing you on the 24th at Banana Blossom and hopefully we'll see some of our other listeners over there as well be a great time yeah. thank you so much again for having me on the show and uh, happy to come on again with Christopher at some point to talk we will definitely be uh, we'll, we'll definitely work that out <laughs> sounds good thanks alright thanks and that's it for this week's episode thank you so much for tuning in to the Crew of Japan podcast And thank you so much to Stephen Lyman of Japan Distilled Podcast and Honkaku Spirits for joining us today. This conversation was so fascinating, and it was incredible to learn so much about Jokichi Takamine. Check out Stephen and the Japan Distilled Podcast when you have a moment and prepare for your mind to be blown in terms of the amount of knowledge you'll learn not only about Jokichi Takamine and his contributions to the world, but also all things distilled spirits and beverages in Japan. It's definitely worth checking out, and I'll have it all linked out in the show notes. Did you know about Jokichi Takamine before today's episode? Share with us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Blue Sky, whatever other social media platform is a pop up between now and then. Just share with us at Crew of Japan Podcast. You'll find us wherever. Just search Crew of Japan, K R E W E O F J A P A N P O D C A S T. While you're there, give us a follow, a like, a retweet, a share, a comment, a repost. A thumbs up, a subscribe, a skeet, a reskeet, whatever else floats your boat. Let us know how you're enjoying the podcast. Or perhaps maybe you prefer to provide your feedback in a more private setting. Send us an email at crewofjapanpodcast at gmail.com. K R E W E O F J A P A N P O D C A S T at gmail.com. Speaking of feedback, if you are enjoying this episode, and trust me, I enjoyed it a lot. If you enjoyed this episode or the previous episodes we had with Konishiki, with Shinichi Mine of Tabi Eats, any of those episodes or the ones from the first half of the season, feel free to leave us a five star rating or review on your favorite podcast streaming app. These readings and reviews really help others who are interested in Japan and this type of content find the podcast. So, any and all support is incredibly appreciated. And don't forget, July 24th, if you're in New Orleans, don't forget to sign up for the Spirit Away, A Taste of Whiskey, Shochu, and more 
and Banana Blossom. That's between Japan Society and Honkaku Spirits. So Steven will be there, I'll be there, and many other people will be there. Come on out. The link will also be in the show notes. But that's it for today. Until next time. <laughs>